Hello and welcome back to See the Pattern. In this final episode of the Sun series, we will be examining star evolution and understanding how an electric model fits in with this. Now the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram is used to group stars into various categories and shows the standard life cycle of stars. It is based on observations, so an electric star model must be able to match these observations. In the electric star model, the most important factor in determining any given star's characteristics is the strength of the current density at the star's surface. If the incoming current rises, the arc discharge on its surface, the tufts, will get hotter, changing from red to blue and get brighter. So the absolute brightness of any star in this model depends on two things, the star's size and the strength of the current density at the surface of the star. On the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, the lower right shows stars with low electrical stress, low surface current densities and the plasma is in dark mode. Moving to the left, current density is increasing as the plasma goes from glow mode into arc mode on the photosphere. Now recently they've made some very interesting discoveries of extremely cool L-type and T-type dwarfs, meaning that the diagram has had to be extended even further to the right. Now the spectra of these objects resembles the spectra we receive from, from Jupiter, and they have a surface temperature of about 1000 degrees Kelvin, and they are small and too cool to be powered by fusion. In the fusion model, you require a temperature of about 3 million Kelvin in the core. Now the temperature will rise with pressure, so the minimum size is about 75 times the size of Jupiter, and many of the dwarfs that we see in this category do not meet this requirement. The Chandra telescope recently discovered a brown dwarf emitting an X-ray flare. In the fusion model, this is simply not possible. However, in the electric star model, the size and the temperature of the body play no part. If the plasma in the star is operating near the dark mode boundary, then any slight increase in the current density at that specific portion on the surface would cause that part to switch into glow mode. If the change is rapid enough, then this would cause a change in the voltage and hence create a strong temporary electric and magnetic field. And if this change was sufficiently rapid, then the changing electric and magnetic field would give rise to X-ray emissions. And this could equally happen if the field collapsed and it returned to its previous current density. As we move up the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, the current density increases and this would give rise to a greater number of tufts on the surface, and this in turn would mean an increase in the luminosity and the temperature on the surface. Most stars in our proximity are actually binary stars. Now, the question is what could cause these to form in an electric star model? Now, we've already seen that the electrical forces prevent the star from collapsing due to gravity. Electrical fissioning could cause the star to split into two, and depending on how evenly this split is, it would either form a secondary companion star or potentially a gas giant. Just prior to this process, the star would suddenly brighten and a nova-like outburst would accompany the fissioning process. Now, this would explain why so many of the stars we have observed are binary or trinary, and why so many of the observed stars also seem to have large gas giants orbiting very closely. The incoming current would cause the ions and the electrons to increase the normal drift velocity, and if this exceeds their thermal velocity, a double layer can form in the incoming current, and this double layer can then move down into the star and act similar to a membrane in a living cell. If the current density continues to increase, it can cause the double layer to shatter, splitting the material in two, and this process will be marked by a steady rise in luminosity of the star as well as the observed temperature and colour changes. This is actually very similar to the way that biological cells divide. The surface area of the two newly created spheres is about 25% larger than before and therefore immediately reduces the current density at the surface. During this process other materials might also be ejected in a nova-like explosion, creating a planetary nebula surrounding and expanding around the two newly formed objects. If the split is uneven, then the smaller one might have its current density abruptly reduced, turning it into a brown dwarf or a gas giant. In the standard model of star evolution, the stars age slowly and they move across the Hertzsprung diagram along the main sequence from top left to bottom right, taking millions of years to carry out this journey. During this process, they use up their nuclear fuel 
and undergo changes due to the change in composition and the change in terms of what they're actually burning in the core. Eventually either dying in a supernova explosion or running out of fuel altogether and simply cooling over a very long period of time. At the extremes of the main sequence we have the red giants and these are stars which are cool but luminous so they are extremely large and their diameters can actually change by up to 60% over a given period of time. And their density is extremely low, about one ten thousandth the Earth atmosphere. And some astronomers have actually described them as red hot vacuums. Uh, some have extremely low surface temperatures, uh, lower than about a thousand degrees Kelvin. So the question is how do these stars with such low densities and surface temperatures possibly maintain nuclear fusion? Now in an electrical model these stars are simply experiencing very low excitation. And in the lower left we have the white dwarfs. Uh, they have very low luminosities but are extremely hot. In the electric star model they are explained as having very high current densities. In the standard model these stars are described as being at the end of their life having expended all of their nuclear fuel billions of years previously and they are left to cool very very slowly like cooling embers on a fire. The light they emit comes from the heat remaining from the earlier nuclear fusion. Now our sun is about 4.5 billion years old and it's not even halfway through its life cycle. And the problem is that no one has actually observed this process and our records for the stars only go back a few thousand years at best. So there are some really good examples that show that this slow evolution of stars is wrong and that actually what happens can be very dramatic and very rapid. So let's examine some of those examples. FG Sagittae. Now this star has changed from being a blue star to a yellow star since the early 1900s and recently its luminosity has dropped significantly. In the early 1900s FG Sagittae was a hot star about 50,000 Kelvin and had a magnitude of 13 and over the next 60 years it cooled to about 8,000 degrees Kelvin and the brightness changed to a magnitude 9 so it increased its brightness and it shifted its radiation from ultraviolet to visible light. Now in the 1970s new spectral lines appeared for strontium, yttrium, zirconium and barium and from the 1970s to the 1980s the temperature continued to drop. In 1992 its magnitude suddenly dropped to 14 and this continued through to 1996 when its magnitude had dropped so much that a companion star became visible. Was this caused by electrical fissioning, the sudden nova light brightness increase followed by a rapid decrease in luminosity, a loss of temperature, the discovery of a new companion and the fact that it sits within a nebulous nova remnant? Aquila and Sagittaria are objects that have been observed since the 1920s and show very similar traits to what we've just discussed. Both have changed their spectral type and their surface composition very rapidly. Monocerotis. Over a two week period in January 2002 an astronomer observed a new star appearing and over the next few months it brightened to a magnitude 6.5 and then faded again and it was surrounded by a glowing cloud and the cloud has expanded over time and then currently it is only a magnitude 16 star and for a short period of time it was one of our brightest stars in our own galaxy. It is also a binary pair and it is the coolest supergiant that we have ever observed. In March 2002 it was around 4000 Kelvin. Just seven months later and it was only a thousand Kelvin. Sirius is the brightest star in our sky. It is a type A main sequence brilliant white star. It is about 1.8 times the size of our sun but it has about 23 times its luminosity. The surface temperature is around 10,000 Kelvin. It however was not always like this. It is also known as the dog star and in ancient times Ptolemy described it as being red or coppery in colour. But in the 10th century Al Safi, a Persian astronomer, did not include it in the stars that he categorised as red. 
Over this period it has changed from being a red cool star to a bright hot star. Through modern observations we know that it is actually a binary star and its companion is a small white dwarf. Castor is designated as the alpha star in the constellation Gemini. Now an alpha category is given to the brightest star in that named constellation but oddly enough it is not as bright as the beta star Pollux. Therefore Castor has lost luminosity over time and if we examine Castor we see that it is actually made up of six small stars that revolve around each other in a complex dance. Now did this star suffer a series of catastrophic fissures causing its brightness to fade over time? Capella is now the brightest star in the constellation Auriga. Ptolemy described it in ancient times however as a red star. So again another example of a star that has changed its colour, its temperature over a relatively short period of time. Spectral lines show the elements present in the gases on or above the surface of a star. Now our Sun exhibits 68 of the known elements in the periodic table. Hot stars do not show this and instead show a more blurred spectral line. When an absorbing gas is placed in an electric field the spectral lines split asymmetrically and this is called the Stark effect and is often referred to as a broadening or blurring of the spectral lines. Now as we progress from the right to the left up the main sequence we move from less electrically stressed to higher electrically stressed stars and we also see an increase in the broadening of the spectral lines as we progress up the diagram. Now Dr Earl Milton reported on, on a, a, a piece of research he was conducting on spectral line broadening in the 1970s and he noted that in a highly stressed B-type star a line at 4471.6 angstroms was always accompanied by what he categorized as a forbidden partner at 4469.6 angstroms. Now the problem is that this only ever occurs in an electric field so you only get this secondary forbidden partner due to the presence of an electric field and therefore this is more evidence to suggest that the stars that we are observing are electrical stars and not nuclear fusion stars. And that brings us to the end of the Sun series. In part one we looked at problems with the fusion model, in part two we looked at the model for an electric sun and today we've looked at examples of stellar evolution and how an electrical star can help to explain some of the anomalies that we've observed. I hope you found this series informative and useful and as always be brave, be curious, the truth is waiting for us. Until next time.